Thank you, precious Lord, for blessing us so richly with your presence. Thank you for the supply of your spirit. Thank you for the transformations that are already taking place. Thank you for the many lives that you are changing. Thank you for the activations of your spirit. Thank you, Father, for the quickening, for the accelerated work that you are doing even in our midst. Thank you for your heritage that have been trapped even upon this land. Thank you for the mighty men that you are raising in this territory to become a voice even to the world. Thank you for your instructions, your wisdom, your counsel that is rising from this quarters to bring perspective, to bring orientation, to bring wisdom even to the, the body of Christ in totality to shape us, to align with your kingdom, to receive capacity, enhancement, even for the work that you are doing in our dispensation. Thank you for the many that you are numbering from our midst and sending out into the world as arrowheads to bring your glory to the nations of the world. Thank you for the many more things that you are doing that we know not of. We give you glory, we give you honor. Take all the glory, Father. And even this morning, Father, we draw to you, we ask that you instruct our hearts even once more, one more time so that we will live here not just for the euphoria of the atmosphere and the presence but that a tangible molecule will be formed in our spirit that will carry us even to the next phase of our walk with you. Take all the glory, Father. In Jesus' precious name. Hallelujah. Praise the Lord. You may be seated. It's an easy task to hold the fort and the banners of Zion in the territory. It takes grace to do that. It takes commitment. It takes brokenness for a man to stand in a very volatile terrain like the one we have here and standing to defend the integrity of God and the advancement of his kingdom. We are so honored to have you, Daddy. Your presence here means a lot, not just to the people, but it means a lot to God. You know, Zaria is a land of great spiritual heritage. When you come to a place like Zaria, emphasis primarily is not just to unveil perspective and to bring revelation to the Word of God, because there is so much revelation floating and flying around everywhere for the great men of God that are within the terrain. Our fathers here, mighty men of God, as you come into Zaria, what pops into your mind are great ministers like Daddy Akwami, great general of God, Apostle Joshua Selman. You know it's a territory that is flooded with light, and of course, you know you are not just coming to instruct the people. You are coming trusting God to find you a vessel through which He would be transmitted to touch the lives of people. Because oftentimes, the challenge we have is not the challenge of revelation. Most times you are in a place where there is so much revelation, but you discover that there is little transformation in the lives of the people. They become so proud for what they know. They become so proud for the people they associate with. It can be simple for you to just gather messages of these great men of God. And as you go out to minister, you can preach the same message and everybody will be wow. How you came about these dimensions of God. And you can say it with so much veracity. But the truth is that you are far from the experience of the things that you utter. And most times we don't take the time out to examine ourselves to see whether the things we hear are actually becoming an everyday experiential reality in our lives. We move around in the deception, in the pride of proclaiming things that we have never experienced 
running into the deception of making people feel that we are walking in dimensions that we have never experienced, talking verbosely about a God that we don't even know, and then we take pride in the people that we relate with, having not touched their heritages and their encounters with God. See, Judas was with Jesus all through his ministry. He even assumed the status of a treasurer. But he never knew the Jesus he lived with all his life. He never entered into the heritage that was predestined for him. In fact, his walk with Jesus became the element that activated his greed and his sentiments until that became the reason why he was ostracized from the economy of God. How, how, how terrible it is to understand that you are given such a hallowed position in God, but at the end of the day, you made a choice that removed you from experiencing that dimension of God that would have been an eternal heritage for you. Jesus told the apostles, he said, the twelve of them will sit with him on twelve thrones to judge the twelve tribes of Israel. How on earth would Judas ever walk out of such an honor in an eternal kingdom that knows no end? Probably he was so proud that he was in the closest clique of Jesus. He was so proud that he kept the money. You know how the feeling is that you could just be in the public and say, yes, I know, I know, I know, I know that the Abu Bakr. In fact, you can even call him so that people know you know him. You know. How you can tell everybody that I, I stayed in the same house with Joshua Selman. Yeah, we are pals. And you don't, you forget that colleagues don't bless colleagues. He said, without any contradiction, the lesser is blessed of the greater. So we stay around the fire, but we never receive the heat of the fire. We stay around many revelations, but we never enter into any economy in God. When you are in a place where the fire of God is so fervent and revelations are flying, you need to pray to God every day to help you sustain a disposition of humility where you can receive of the things that are coming. Else you will be in the place where the fire is rising, but the people from afar will be blessed. You will see people listen to the message, having not met the men, but enter into deeper dimensions in God. And one day they will stay from afar and reference the people you lived with all your life, that they mentored them, and they have never met them. Changing their world and making so great impact, and you who will be there will only live with the pride and arrogance that you know them and you were close to them. You can quote how many of the meetings you attended, how many times hands were laid on you, but as you journey in God, you will realize that everything you receive of God is only a seed. It is what you do with Him that determines whether it will be transformed into a tangible substance that will make meaning in your life. We need brokenness in our generation. We need so much humility in our generation to be able to domesticate the things that God has in mind for us to do. It's such a window period that we are, we are actually in scarcity of time to fulfill the mandate of God. That is why the Holy Spirit is in so much hurry, releasing so much operations, so much dispensation, so much dimensions, so much graces are being released in an accelerated fashion. It's, 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 a, it's, it's an indication of how short a time we have to make an impact. The Lord needs to help our hearts. This morning, I want to just share with us briefly on the disposition that we must assume in order to become pliable in the hands of God. It's possible for God to hover around a building but never alight. Because spirits and their operations are in another dimension. For you to be able to trap the dimensions of spirits, you must assume an orientation that makes it possible for them to alight upon you. So why God wanted to dwell with his people, he had to summon Moses to the mountain and instruct him very rigidly on the specification of the tabernacle. Because the only basis by which the Holy Ghost can dwell and descend upon the tabernacle is, is for, for Moses to sustain that orientation that was revealed to him on the mount. Because if that orientation is not sustained, there will be a distortion. And even though God will want so much to bless you, 
it will be impossible for him to do that. Because the way he designed the realm is such that it is legalistic. It is governed by very rigid laws and precepts that himself cannot alter. That is why you come for a meeting and the atmosphere is so thick, everybody is falling under the anointing, but the same people go to the market and they are different people. Thousands falling under the anointing, screaming under the anointing, but we don't see a change in our offices. There is no change in the market. God is not on the scene. We take so much pride in the move of God in church, whereas our closest neighbors are not even inspired by what is happening. The ripple effect does not even transmit to affect them. Meanwhile, the people Jesus raised were just a few of them, 120 persons, and in a short period of time, the Bible said, these be the men that turn their worlds upside down. We take so much pride in the things that happen in church, and we even say it with so much audacity. But it's so amazing that our next door neighbor does not even know what is happening. He cannot even as much as see the Lord. And it's a, it's, a, it's a deficiency in the Christianity of our generation. We have so much experiences in God. We have so much encounters. But it does not translate to a transformation on ground. You read stories of men like John Knox. Who enter into a place and people begin to weep for their sins. Even not having preached the gospel. People begin to weep. What is breaking out of his spirit? How did he come to this level where his presence could command so much righteousness that sin is convicted in the heart of people? I heard a story about Reinhard Bonke, who entered the shop in South Africa. And these new agers that feel everything is about cerebrality looked at him and began to cry. And Reinhard Bonke did not even as much as ask the man what was wrong. He asked the Holy Spirit, what happened? That is the kind of intimacy they sustain with God. It would have been easier to ask the man. But he didn't ask him. He rather asked the Holy Spirit. And he said, he saw me in your eyes. What did this man do to come to such depths in God? Their lives have become a theater through which the dimensions of heaven can be revealed. They have become a mast. That God could alight upon in so much tangibility that you could literally touch God by touching them. Because that was the, that was the original design God had in mind. He said when he created and let them have dominion. You see, it is possible for you to begin to strive for dominion when you have not sustained the image and the likeness of God. But dominion is not a function of your power. Dominion is a function of the degree of your alignment with God because it is the image and the likeness of God emitting through your vessel that dominates your world. As his image, you become exactly like him. So he can fizzle into you without any distortion in orientation. As his likeness, he can walk out through you in diverse manifestations without any contradiction or mistake of whether it is you or God. God will be so revealed through you that there will be no question as to the fact that it is God manifested through you. That is the secret of dominion. And that is the pattern that have always been sustained. By heritage, we have been designed to sustain so much stature with God that we are ahead of creation. Everything that God created was supposed to be subject to our, our, our authority. But when there is a crisis, the crisis arises because of the distortion in our disalignment with God, causing us not to reveal his dimension, but revealing our dimension. And unfortunately, we are handicapped without God. The Bible said by inheritance, Jesus was the heir of God. By inheritance, he sustains a position of exercising the highest authority in the kingdom. By inheritance. But when he became man, he had to follow a protocol. A protocol of ascending that level of authority with God. And the reason he did that is to show us that that is the only path through which we can arise into power, into authority with God. 
Every one of us here have needs. Staring us in the face. And the problem is not the unavailability of power to address those needs. That's not the problem. The problem is our inability to apprehend what we have with God. Because we want to do it our own way. Not the laid down precepts of the kingdom. Power and authority is supposed to be our heritage. But there is something you do in order to sustain a disposition through which you can transmit power naturally. Every time you begin to struggle with a spiritual thing, just know that you don't have it. Jesus had to follow a protocol. A protocol that brought him to that place where he was naturally lifted up. He said, and I, if I be lifted up. It's not something you struggle. It's something you submit to go through. It's something you yield to go through. It's something you align with to go through. And the moment you begin to align, you discover you begin to die to yourself. You see, the devil is so intelligent. A lot of people take him for granted. Some call him stupid. So subtle, so wise, he understands your appetite. He understands what to do to turn you on so that you sustain an orientation that is against the flow of life. The same thing was what he did in the garden. And he altered the orientation of the first creatures. And they stepped out of the purpose of God. It is the same strategy he uses on everybody. In your yieldedness to God, what you do is that you tame your appetite. So that you can come to a point where you sustain that orientation. Nobody revealed it better than Jesus. We began yesterday by revealing to us how that the mission of the Holy Spirit is to bring us to a point where we become exactly like Jesus. And the first thing the Holy Ghost does is that he carries us to a point where we see Jesus as the Son of God. And that is expected to strike a confidence, a conviction, and an assurance in our heart. And that conviction will bring us to a point where we voluntarily decide to yield to him. Having seen the kind of personality that he is, and having recognized the fact that outside of him we have no relevance. And we said the second thing the Holy Ghost does is to reveal to us Jesus, the Savior. And by that revelation, we now sustain the capacity to receive everything that he has already given to us in him. And the third thing we said the Holy Ghost would do for us is to reveal to us Jesus, the, the Christ. As the Christ, he is the administrator of all the policies of God. He is the administrator of everything that has to do with the operations of heaven and the will of God. And as you subscribe to him, we say what that does to us is that it awakens us to the need to take up responsibilities in the house of God. And I said that is where our callings come from. So the apostles, the prophets, the pastors, the evangelists, the teachers, all of that comes from the revelation of Jesus the Christ. And I told us it is one of the questions of redemption. In Isaiah chapter 53 verse 8, the Bible said, Who has believed our report? Unto whom is the arm of the Lord revealed? And in verse 8 he said, Who shall declare his generation? The one that declares his generation is the one that sees the Christ. When he was lifted up, he gave gifts unto men. So when you are in church, or when you are alive, and you are not taking responsibility for the kingdom, it's probably because you have not realized, or you have not been revealed to Jesus the Christ. So you have not seen the responsibility that has been apportioned to you. So even though you are born again, even though you are not living by the dictates of the flesh, you are not living under the power of sin. You are still living for yourself. The job you are looking for is for yourself. Every money that comes to you is for yourself. You come to church only to be blessed. The day they announce that let's go out for evangelism, that's the day you are busy. The day the church has a need, that's the day you have needs. Because you have not, been, you have not, revealed, you have not received the revelation of Jesus the Christ. The moment you receive the revelation of Jesus the Christ, you will realize that even the money that comes to your hand is a trust given to you to steward for the kingdom. That is the day when you can leave your job 
and begin to seek the will of God. Everybody that is serving God today, they are not serving God just because they love to serve God. A burden came upon them that drew them out of their comfort zone. Sometimes that burden begins with lengthy hours of prayers. You just find yourself praying, fasting, and then the higher you go in God, the higher you receive instruction. The higher you receive instruction. There are many that quit their jobs. There are many that could not even graduate from school. And that is not advocating for you not to take your study seriously. I'm just telling you that this body, sometimes they become so strong that you cannot understand it. And then you just yield to it. But some persons have not served God to a level where that body becomes strong enough. So they live for God. They live they are alive as sons of God, but they live for themselves. And I told you the danger of that is that when you have completed your time on earth, then you go to heaven and realize you are not relevant. Because salvation will take every one of us to eternity. But what we determine where we stand in eternity is the quality of service that we render while we were in time. That is why not everybody will sit on the twelve thrones. That is why not everybody will exert so much authority in heaven. Because at that time, God will ask what you have done with what he has given to you. But unfortunately, some of us will go to heaven and realize that everything God gave to us, we lavished it upon our appetites. So we spent all our resources on earth. There is nothing to show in heaven. And the unfortunate thing is that most will not realize until they get to heaven. Then God will tell you, I gave you the grace for worship. That meeting, that meeting you went for, I expected you to bring down my presence. Yes, that time you were having body for prayers. I was actually the one summoning you. But you refused because you wanted to watch a football match. You refused because you needed to go out with somebody to have some fun. And you see, the unfortunate thing is that these windows don't open forever. They are Kairos moments. Sometimes it comes and then you don't respond to it and it goes back. And then it comes after three years again. And you don't respond and it goes back. And it comes after ten years. Maybe the next time it's coming you are 45. So even though you want to, you are weak. So you depart to eternity and realize that those things you felt were burdens were actually immortal summons to bring you into relevance with God. But you never attended to it. Meanwhile, you came for the most powerful meetings. All you remembered was the remas that came down and then you went to talk about how the man of God was so powerful but you never realized that everything that was happening was to invoke you into a calling. So you see everything that is happening, you see the man of God, you see the operations of the spirit, the only thing you don't see is you being included in Jesus. Meanwhile, the goal of the meeting is not for the man of God to perform. The goal of the meeting is to activate an alarm system in your heart to bring you into intimacy with God. But it all boils down to whether or not you receive the revelation of the Christ. The revelation of the Christ is the revelation that brings a Christian to a point of responsibility. That's the longest journey you will travel in life. Because the more you go deeper in faith, the more the righteousness of God will be revealed. You begin to show you right standing. The first year, maybe it was hunger for prayer. You say, pray every night. After some time, he says, rise up, leave, and go here. And you don't know anybody. That's the, that's the story that is replete in the Bible. The revelation of the Christ. Abraham was with his fathers in the hall of the Chaldees. And the Bible said God had told him to leave his father's house, to leave his country, to leave his kindred, and to leave his father's house, and to go to the land that he will show him. And just like you and I, it was difficult. It was so difficult that he remained until his own father, who was not called, perceived it, and rose and began to travel from the hall of the Chaldees until he came to Haran and stopped there. And Abraham stopped with him. How many of you here has God been calling from when you were in primary school? Some of you in secondary school. But right now, you can't even sense that energy anymore. You know why? It has dissipated. Now you are so satisfied in talking about men of God. You have a lexicon of men of God and the kind of manifestation that is in their life. You have already ruled yourself out. The energy is no longer there. And it's not just about calling in ministry. Some is in business. Because the call is not just into the fivefold. The goal of Jesus is for us to disciple the whole world. 
He said, go into all the world and disciple all nations. I'm trying to be very basic so that everybody can be included in the message. Go into all the worlds. The political corridor is a world. The business corridor is a world. We need apostles in government. We need apostles in the market. But where are they? We only have apostles in the church with very big titles. And people listen to them every day. They are not transformed. We listen to them every day. Rather, we begin to talk like them. We listen to them and we go out and we become their, their ambassadors. And the kingdom is far behind. Where are we in the equation? We have never found ourselves. It's a body. It's a challenge. You don't have to look it to be it. I told us about Katun Kuman yesterday. Very weak, feeble and frail. But the kind of power that broke out of that woman, the world will never recover from it. The dimension of glory that she walked in is only a reality you can fascinate about. You don't have to look it to be it. And it's not a function of big, big rema. Neither is it a function of doctrinal exegesis. Every one of us that have received the Holy Ghost have been imputed it a web, a software that the voice of God runs on. So we have all heard the voice of God. Because the Holy Ghost is a software on our inside. The voice of God runs on that software. But you see, we have not been given a kind of teaching that makes us look into God. We rather look unto men. That is why you have not heard the software. But until you begin to hear that voice of God, you will never amount to anything in life. Have you heard any man of God quoting somebody and say, this person told me, go and start the church here. You hear, God told me. God told me. God said. God said. Because with the voice of God comes the energy to perform. We know so much, but we are doing so little. I just want to bring us a quiet reminder this morning. I was vibrating in my spirit this morning to come for a power session. But the Holy Ghost say, whisper quietly to them. I want people to accept the call this morning. We have seen so much power that we have become familiar with it. So when the power of God is moving, people are screaming. Somebody is just there. I did church. I did church. I will call you later. Power of God is moving. And somebody is just... Sit down. And it's resting somewhere. If you know the voice of God and it's real to you, you can't take it for granted. You will never take it for granted. And that's what your destiny depends on. Big, big remas, but no transformation. How do you get into this? Begin from where you are. From where you are. That point, the last point of instruction... That is where the journey begins from. As you cast your mind back, what was the last thing the Holy Ghost told you? Of course, a lot of people don't remember again. There's no challenge with that. God can speak again. But for those who remember the last thing God told you, that's where you begin from. That's where the journey begins from. You go back and tell him, now you are willing. And it doesn't matter. Age is not a factor in this game. This is a function of grace. You can be a teenager and begin. And you can be an old man and begin. Sweet Migos were began at 45. But the question is, have you heard the voice? When was the last time God spoke to your heart? What did you do about it? We can run to a program and wait for two weeks to hear a man of God. Who most times doesn't even have time for us. But here is the Holy Ghost beckoning, shouting, screaming. Quiet, still voice. Every approach he knows in your heart, but you have not responded. There's a challenge. There's a challenge. There's a fundamental challenge. There's a fundamental challenge. We need to return to God. We have even gone so backward that a simple gospel does not make meaning to us anymore until the emotional cords are stretched. 
See, the emotional cords are so touched that, wow! Or the, the tempo is so high. That's a challenge. And we must resolve it this morning. There are most persons that God are giving clear-cut instructions. Clear-cut instructions like Abraham. But we have sat at one spot for a long time. For a long time. When Abraham decided to stand up again, that was not when God spoke to him. If you read Genesis chapter 12, you think that was when God spoke. It was when Stephen was giving the narrative that he told us it was in the hall of the Chaldees God spoke to Abraham. When Abraham got up from Haram, he now made up his mind to now attend to the voice that spoke to him. He may have spoken to you 10 years ago. The day you make up your mind, that is the day he will start business with you. And nobody has a challenge of hearing God because every one of us here hear demons. As they are whispering into your ears, do this, do that. And not one, not one of us here has a challenge of the anointing. Because when the demon of anger speaks, the strength moves. That's a negative anointing. So every one of us here is receptive to the anointing. Our challenge is not a challenge of the anointing. Our challenge is a challenge of submitting our will to the Holy Spirit. And we have traveled so far that we have become so full of ourselves. We need to go back to God again. Enough of the rema. We do all the exegesis. We do all the hermeneutics. But at the end of the day, people live and they are the same way they are. I've come to realize that this thing begins more with choice. If you can get a man to a point where he makes up his mind for God, then you see the greatest miracles, the miracle of transformation. That is when through one man, a thousand people can be brought back to God. That is when through one man, a whole territory can be colonized. But most times, even we, the man of God, we are so much under pressure to perform. See, you have come here to represent Apostle Arome Osai. The whole place must be on fire because you've come for Apostle and all of that. Meanwhile, that's not the direction God is going. I didn't know the man of God that came out yesterday said the word of God was piercing him. And then he decided to make up his mind to follow Jesus. Who knows what he will become? Billy Graham, we were told, was the only person that made up his mind the day he gave his heart to Christ. And while he was going, this was not a church record. It was Wikipedia that recorded that he won over 64 million people to God. And U.S. Time magazine recorded over 50, 55 times that he was one of the most responsible personalities in the world. U.S. Time magazine doesn't just appoint people. Let me give you an instance. World football began in 1930 in Uruguay. But the first footballer that U.S. Times Magazine recognized was Kaka. That was over 80 years. That is to tell you the kind of impact that Billy Graham left his world with. When he was to be buried, he was kept. We are let American presidents that die on seat are kept. That's like the highest honor in America. He was not a man of signs and wonders. But he shook, he shook his world. He transformed the lives of many people. It's time to make a decision for Jesus. Beautiful enough today is the anniversary. We need younger generations to be churned into the work. See how excited daddy was when he was talking about our dear pastor. How that he was a young man that followed. How many of his type will you see? And then we are amazed that the church is not making the needed impact. It's not time for one man to colonize every other person. It's time for everybody to realize his elements. Yours may be helps. Yours may be a word of grace. Yours may be kindness. That's all God needs. You don't need to be on the pulpit. Only the spirit of God will amplify it. When that amplification comes, there's a change. But the only way you can sustain an orientation through which God can flow through you to amplify His grace upon your life is when you sustain the orientation of brokenness. The Bible spoke about Jesus. 
I told us yesterday when he came to John's baptismal service, he went down for John to baptize him. Even John himself knew it was impossible. It was, this can't, it shouldn't. You should be the one. He said, no, suffer it to be so for now. Thus it becometh of us to fulfill all righteousness. And he went down to be baptized. The Bible said as he rose up, he rose up praying and the heavens opened. And the Spirit of God descended upon him like a dove. You would think that day was a day of manifestation or a day of unveiling. But that was the day the protocol of brokenness began from. He said the Spirit led him into the wilderness to be tempted of the devil. That he made a very striking statement. He said our generation is not a generation that likes to wait. We are a generation of revelation. All of us want to appear and begin to... F- we have something to offer. He went into the wilderness. Do you remember Jesus is the word of God? He doesn't need to read to speak. He is the word that you and I preach. But he went under the authority of the Holy Spirit into the wilderness. He said while he was there, he fasted and he prayed. And he was... After 40 days of fasting and praying, he was afterward and hungered. And he said the devil came and tempted him. And he passed the test. And he returned in the power of the Spirit. He returned in the power of the Spirit. Not to do what he willed, but to do what the Father willed. That's a broken man. Some of us have told everybody about our encounters. But how much service have we rendered to God? The Bible spoke about John. Before he was born, the angel came and gave a very robust, a very robust narrative about the man. How that he was the Elijah to come. He shall go in the spirit and in the powers of Elias. Wow. That was a very bogus, bogus declaration about a man. I thought John would go about, I am the Elijah. But the Bible said he was separated into the wilderness until the day of his showing forth unto Israel. When brokenness is achieved, then the dimensions of God that breaks out of a man is amazing. You can't imagine it. God literally brings you into an ordination that your ma- you will never believe you are the one doing it. What God will do through you will will be so bigger than you that you will never even have the audacity to call it your work. That's why you hear most men of God say, our church is the church of the Holy Ghost. We are participating with him. It's too big. You know you could never have done this. I, the Lord, I try the heart. I test the reins to give unto every man as his way should be. We don't have broken people. We are fasting and praying. Pursuing people that we are serving. But we are not even serving. We are just following them that something should drop. They did something drop, we are gone. A young man goes to fast and pray for 90 days. He's crying for power. Why does he need power? It's not like he has compassion for the sick. But he has to manifest. Let them know that he has come. People praying for gifts or word of knowledge. Why do we need word of knowledge? When we come for meeting, let them know how forensic we are. Our convictions, our motives are, are wrong. If we receive that power, we will die. Sometimes God saves us by refusing us certain things. Because the day we touch it, we are gone. I went for a meeting at the orientation camp for their power night and the Virtually every copper was on the floor. In fact, I'd never seen such dimension of power. I left that meeting three hours later. People were still on the floor crying. And normally I don't talk like this. It was so electrified. And while I was in the meeting, I stretched forth my hands and I said, I judge the principality over this territory. <laughs> you don't know what... You don't know what is it. What there, there is something in our heart. You are fathers. This generation, we have something here. <laughs> the arrogance. <laughs> and while I was on my way home, the, the car tire in front exploded. What? 
I said, relax. The guys have followed me. Fix it. Let's go. We were going again. The tire exploded. That was where we stopped and began to ask for mercy. <laughs> I went over and I, I, <laughs> I told the apostle and the apostle looked at me and laughed. He said, brother, he said, in the kingdom there are jurisdictions. <laughs> there are jurisdictions. Because you see the power of God moving does not mean, you know I was telling you something yesterday about principalities, not being demons. About the ranking of fallen angels. Now, this is not just a quest to talk about mysticism. Because mysticism and appetite for mystical operations have eaten up the soul of this generation. That's not my, my attempt. I just want to show you that in the demonic there are ranks. You cast out demons. Because they were not even part of the equation of creation. Demons were not part of the equation. Demons were actually a product of the intercourse between the sons of God and the sons of men. And when the creation was destroyed, they moved about. I don't have time to begin to open all of that for you. Because it will take a lot of scriptures to substantiate this position. So they don't have legality to occupy any vessel. So anybody that has authority in the spirit can cast out a demon. But fallen angels are not so. They have bodies. And even when they fell, they fell as ranking entities. That's why the Bible called them principalities. They are princes without polity. So they have authority. And he called them rulers of the darkness of this world. So anywhere there is darkness, they are already enthroned there. And they are called spiritual wickedness in the heavenly places. You can't cast them out. Rather, they can break into your circle and fight with you. If you don't have authority, they will enslave you. That's why Paul said we wrestle not against flesh and blood. You war with them. And while you are warring with them, they can throw darts at you. They are entities. And here was this young man, because he saw things happening, he began to speak out of tune. And they, they just flashed me to show me that mm, this thing have their jurisdictions about this matter. Because you hear a father make a statement, don't try it. Arrogance will kill you. I laid down and told him, I was praying. And then the Spirit of God carried my spirit. And then I saw myself hovering around the city. Showing me different spots, the things that happened. And when I came back into my body, I now said, I judge the principality over my body. The demon of iniquity. As I spoke, I was not in a trance. My eyes were open like this. A lady walked out of the wall naked. I wanted to stand up, but I was held down. And her head was the head of a man. I saw her with a red apron, like a Babylonian prostitute. And she walked around me. You know, these guys have audacity. Do you see when the devil came to tempt Jesus? Say, if you are the son of God. (laughs) They have audacity. Walked around me and came and sat on my chest. I pushed this being. He didn't even notice if something was touching her. Now, I don't know even if it's a her or a he. And now, <laughs> you know, when, when you are young in the faith, you do a lot of foolish things. I now beat her on the back. <laughs> this being did not as much as Tom. When I saw that this thing, I needed mercy. I said, Lord, save me. <laughs> and light struck from heaven and this being dematerialized. Why the being left for two weeks Every young lady I saw, I wanted to sleep with her. She left me with a deposit of lust. What? I now ran to her person. I said, this is what happened. He said, you and these princes, stop binding them. He said, when you get there, the Holy Ghost will give you a trance. He now laid hands on me and prayed for me. I now realize that the world is more spiritual than we ever think. You can see young people fornicating, running about, you will think they are doing it because they are wayward. But every territory you come under, there is a prince that tries to marginalize the destiny of people. And what God has called us to do is to become kingdom emissaries that will uninstall the workings and the dynamics of those spirits so that liberty can come to those people and their destiny can begin to find expression. 
But the only way we can sustain that kind of authority is if we are separated from their influences first. So a man with a bogus appetite, a man with a desire for fame, a man with a desire for glory and pride is already under the influence of the serpentine spirit. He doesn't have the authority to command that kind of power. So the first thing to do is, first of all, to, 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 air, to wash yourself out of their influence. That is why most times before God raises a man, he separates him from the civilization. You can't fight a civilization that has raised you. And the only way you can be completely rid of the influence of a spirit is by becoming broken and entirely submitted to another spirit. That is when the authority of God can begin to break out of you. We went out of Z to contend with things. He said, no, that is not the way. You need to be broken. You need to be broken. When you are broken, then your own flavor will be given to you from heaven. Your own mandate will be rested upon you. The world is more spiritual than you think. There is no time you need the Holy Ghost more than now. There was a time when the battle was against poverty. There was a time when the battle was against sickness and diseases. All of those have not gone. Now you have terrorism added to it. The kind of dimension we need to walk in in order to overshadow and overpower the influence of darkness is greater than what our fathers experienced. What God will bring us into in order to be able to contend with the darkness of our time has to be many times much more than what our fathers saw. But proud men never enter into those corridors. Arrogant men never enter into those corridors. You must come to a point where the Holy Ghost breaks you. It is those cracks on your soul that will become the gate through which the glory of God will ebb out of you. It's like a sponge. When you are pressed, only God will come out. But you must learn not to trust in things. You must learn to cast your ambitions, cast your desires, cast your pride away. Submit it at the cross. Let God deal with it. So that a broken man can appear to reveal the glory of God. There are many persons this morning that has there is this burden of a calling upon your life. You have not as much as stepped out before. Today is the day to make a decision for Jesus. It's a day of decision. If one chases a thousand and two puts ten thousand to flight, what will three do? Today is a day to make a decision. Maybe you came with a lot of expectations to hear a lot of things, to see a lot of things. But like I said when I began, the last thing you have ever seen is you walking with God. You have come to see men of God walk with God, manifest, say a lot of things that fascinates you, but you have never been shaken. You have never been moved. Today is not the day of the man of God. Today is your day. It's time to make a decision for Jesus. It's time to make a decision. You are going to tell the Lord this morning, now specifically, specifically for those of you that you have been sensing the call of God upon your life. Maybe out of fear you felt you were not sufficient. Maybe you felt the time was not right. Maybe fear has submerged you and you have never been able to step out in boldness. Today is a day of decision. That's the burden the Lord has put in my heart. To come and extend my hand to somebody and bring him into the fold. Because he has been knocking on your heart. Some of you have been trying to go in the flesh. You have even been trying to say, what is the name of this ministry? What will I give this ministry? Will it be an apostolic center? Will it be a church? Put all of that aside. Come into the spirit first. It's the Holy Ghost that reveals it. It's not a function of creativity. You can't be creative enough to start a ministry. It will crash. Because it is only sustained by the life of God. Today is a summon for men who want to be broken. Men who don't want to anchor their confidence on things anymore. But they want to choose Jesus. I heard the story of Benihim. He went for a meeting and he returned and he said, Holy Spirit, if this thing they say is true, reveal yourself to me. He was there and after 10 minutes the Holy Ghost showed up. Today it has become a transgenerational ministry. Touching the lives of people across the nations of the world. 
Maybe you have seen some persons and you want to be like them before you begin. That's not the point. The point is, will you accept? Will you come forward? And will you ask God to make out of you what he wants to? Your creativity is nothing compared to the wisdom of God. And what God wants to do with you is not starting today. It began before the foundations of the world. You may just be realizing it today. Or you may just be making the decision today. But it began before the world was created. You can't be creative enough to undo that which was spoken before time began. Everything you know and even your thought processes are a function of the information you have stored. And not the information you have gathered, you gathered it from this realm. The only whispers that come from outside of this realm are the things that were altered by the monarch of Zion himself. It's a season of commitment. So many young people being persuaded to do things that their destiny is anchored upon. Our fathers, they have played their part. We are the men to hand over the baton to. We don't have to come to God only for our needs. God also has a need. One of the needs is for him to be worshipped. Another one is for him to be revealed. He wants to be revealed through you, to your generation, so that darkness can be pushed back. You are here this morning, you have sensed the call of God upon your life. Before now, there have been restrictions of all kinds. You have even been in church environment, apostolic environment, until spiritual things have become so trivial to you. Today, I want to let you know that it's not about what you are seeing. What you are seeing is an overflow of the life of God in the lives of different people. What is important is a heart matter. It's a heart business. Everybody, Jesus, he died again. Even the ones he rose from the dead, they died again. The only thing that is eternal is that which we do for God that cannot be measured in time. It is until you cross through the portals of the great divide that the great one will shake you and say, well done. That is all that matters. That burden is in your heart. It may not necessarily be ministry, but God has put a burden in your heart before now. Do this, do that, do that. The voice has even gone quiet. Today I want you to make a decision. And make a step for Jesus. Now, this is not a call for salvation. This is a call for service. It's a call for service. I want to serve the Lord with all my might. With all my strength. I want my youth to count. Before now, I've been to church to see, to see things happen. But today is my day. I talk about the things I've seen in church, but I've never seen myself in the equation. Today is my day. You want to make that decision for service? Come forward. Let me pray with you. I didn't come to Zaria for revelation. I didn't come to Zaria for fame. I came to Zaria to have people numbered into the armies of Zion. I came to Zaria to see people stand up and enlisted in the armies of the last day. The ones that will hold the banners of Zion. The ones that will stand to defend the heritage of God upon their territories. If you are here, you can begin to talk to God. You can begin to talk to the Holy Spirit. It is the spirit that quickens. The flesh profited nothing. There are issues you have been dealing with in your life before now. You can put them, you can place them before the feet of Christ. He's the one that can help your infirmities. You can drop them now. You have hidden them in the depths of your heart. People have seen you and even called you a man of God, but you and I know that you are far. You are far. It's possible to come here and say a lot of things with a lot of oratorial dexterity, but you will not hear anything. Your emotions will be stirred and you will be vibrating, but you will live here not transformed. And such work is only leveled on appetite. I had the temptation of coming to impress. But there are people God wants to talk to. Jesus said, I have many things to tell you, but you are not ready to hear it. So you don't speak because you know so much. You speak because there is a heart that God wants you to speak to. There's a heart 
God wants to talk to. Mighty men, ranking entities in the kingdom, but having never been beckoned to come before God. Today is the day to make that decision. That decision that will give you eternal relevance. That decision that will cause you to be enlisted in a heightened hierarchy in the kingdoms of God, where you can never be small among men. Peter came to Jesus. He said, we have left all to follow you. He said, what is in this thing for us? Jesus said, not one man that follows me will be small. Not in this life or in the life to come. Nothing is bigger than making a decision for Jesus. Come and run my life, Spirit of the living God. Come and run my life, Yahweh. Come and run my life, Spirit of the living God. Come and run my life. Yahweh, come and run my life. Spirit of the living God, come and run my life. Yahweh, come and run my life. You have been running the rat race. It's time to come before Jesus. Oh, Sons, don't run in such a bread. You see, in the kingdom, sons don't run in search of bread. We pursue inheritance. We don't run because we lack. We run because we see something that is bigger than life itself. Abraham was looking for a city with foundation whose builder and maker was God. He was not rocking because he needed money, silver or gold. It's possible for you to go to school, graduate, running around because you are looking for a job to sustain you every day. You are not a son in the kingdom. We don't run for that. If you go into a setting, it's because God has sent you there as a light. If you go into a school, it's because God has sent you there as a light. If you go into a profession, it's because God has sent you there. The kingdom has bigger needs. What you call a need is what God has already provided for. Only for you to walk and look for the compass of your spirit. And you will find it. You will find it. And much more than that, you will find your life. As we worship God now, the hand of God will begin to touch some of you. To activate the calling of God upon your life. It will be activated. I try not to be emotional when I want to deal with heart issues. I try to keep the tone down. I try not to stir your emotional cause so that you make decisions based on conviction. Even my utterances, I try to keep them very low so that you make convincing decisions. As we sing now, the hand of God will begin to activate those callings. Those callings. And make sure this commitment is beyond just a public show. You will submit yourself to God to serve in the kingdom. Yahweh, come and run my life, Spirit of the Living God. Come and run my life, Yahweh. Come and run my life, Spirit of the Living God. Come and run my life, Yahweh. Come and run my life, Spirit of the Living God. Come and run my life, Yahweh. Spirit of the living God, 
the Lord go ahead and talk to Jesus talk to him for yourself tell him what you have him do to you do with you do through you you see that your heart your heart is being broken hearts hearts are being broken the heartless the heartless the heartless the heartless is being broken it's a heart matter it's a heart matter it's a heart matter you're 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 God you are mighty God you're 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 God you rip, you rip, you rip. Most of us really need to repent. We really need to repent. You see, we have trivialized spiritual things so much and become so big in our own eyes. We need to repent. We need brokenness inside. It's the Holy Ghost that does this work. Brokenness. We are too rigid. All we see is ourselves. We really need to repent. The Lord is doing a heart, a heart circumcision, circumcision of the heart. 
They have placed limitations on God. Talk to Jesus. Ask him to touch your heart this morning. Let the Lord touch your heart. Let there be a purging. A purging. A purging. Some of us really need help. We really need help. We wait on you. Holy Spirit. We wait on you, my Walk on your heart. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. The Lord is going to touch. The Lord is going to touch most of you tangibly right now. You see, I told you stories of my engagements with entities that almost shut me down. It was much later the Lord told me, say, you were full of yourself. You did what you did for a show. And that is why you were almost cut off. But the moment you are broken, you begin to sense accelerated speed. Accelerated speed. Elijah went to pray before coming to tell the king there will be no rain. And after he spoke, he still went back to pray. When the rain came, the Bible said the hand of God came down upon Elijah. And he outran the chariots of Ahab, even unto Jezreel. 
Now I don't go to contend with principalities, but their dominions break on their own accord when I minister. The demons, the princes of immorality, I try to challenge. I don't need to talk to them anymore. But in meetings where I minister, their bonds are broken. Because it's not about the show. It's getting people's lives have meaning. Can you lift your hands now and ask the Lord that you are ready? Tell the Lord you are ready now. Elohim Precious Holy Spirit. Precious Holy Spirit. Look upon their hearts, Lord. These ones have come out before you. Holy Spirit, stretch forth your hands and begin to activate them. Begin to activate them. Begin to activate them. Let's just try to keep calm. Let's just try to keep calm. Let's not be emotional about the moment. Let's just try to keep calm. Or that things don't begin to happen by motion. Holy Spirit, activate them. Activate them. Look at their hearts, Lord. Cause your hand to begin to rest upon them. Let your hands begin to rest upon them. Activate those callings. Those calls of vision that you have planted in their hearts. That the enemy have tried to steal. I call let the fountains of the deep speak. Let your ordinations begin to speak. In the name of Jesus. In the name of Jesus. Let it break open. Let it break forth like an avalanche. Let callings begin to speak. Most of you begin to have different sensations, different sensations, different sensations. You find your hand itching you or unnecessarily getting hot. God is beginning to give you graces, the healing anointing coming upon people right now. The healing anointing. The healing anointing coming upon some persons. Some of you, your legs are beginning to itch you. The healing anointing. Some of you will sense a weight upon your heart. A weight upon your heart. The weight of the glory resting upon your heart. Even right now. Even right now. Different oppressions of the spirit. Different oppressions of the spirit. There are activations, callings, ordinations resting upon you. Man take a bosata pare de basata. Rapapa take bondo sobre da gatidas. Rapa take bondo sapar. Rapa take parazana. Rande ke pondre parazata. Rapa take bondo para babatidas. Repetendre takilo pandre para babapas. Raka bondo sopate. Mantra zapate bozondo. Rape take bondo sobe. Mante se ke tobra. Rapa papataria satanina ha. Rakombra sate ke boas. Ordinations. Ordinations calling forth. 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 Ordinations calling forth.
Kambra sate ke bundo sapateria. Repe de bunde sapeli kozorina tabas. Bantra paros tonzo prakatira. Mandele de bundos. The Lord is granting somebody the gift of prophecy. The gift of prophecy. The gift of prophecy. The gift of prophecy. Take it in the name of Jesus. Rapate ke bundo parabara sataba. Rapa bade ke bundo paradiasta. Raki bundo sate kaparenda ha. Radatia talendre tagapiras. Raka bundo saprate. Rapate bundo salia. The angels of God are heightening the gift of discernment of spirits. The gift of discernment of spirits. The Lord is opening the eyes of a young man. I see a heightened dimension of the gift of the discernment of spirit. The gift of discernment of spirit. Father, let it rest upon him. Mando sapateko.